thank you so much for joining Shape America's Comprehensive School Physical Activity Program Research Special Interest Group, or SIG. That was a mouthful. Um, for uh, the presentation on CSPAT, Bridging the Gap Between Research and Practice. This It's evening where I am. Um, I think it's probably midday where uh, Dr. Centeo is. Uh, my name is Audra Walters, and I'm the Senior Manager of Healthy Schools for Shape America. Uh, before we get started, um, I just have a couple of quick housekeeping items that will help this experience go smoothly. Uh, first of all, this session is being recorded, and a recording will be available on the website um, next week. Still letting folks in. Um, please make sure that you remain muted until acknowledged by either the presenters or the facilitator um, to come off mute for the discussion and question and answer time. Um, in the meantime, you can use the chat box function to interact with other attendees and ask questions throughout the presentation. Um, you can also direct message me in that chat if you have any technology issues and feel free to introduce yourself in the chat if you haven't already. And finally, if you need to use closed captioning, you can access that feature in your Zoom toolbar. If you need um, help figuring out how to access that, you can just let me know. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Erin Santeo. Thanks, Audra. So I'm really excited to be here today to welcome everyone to this session on behalf of the, on behalf of the Shape America CISPAP Research SIG. Um, I'm the current chair of the CISPAP SIG, and I know that we have a couple of past chairs on here as well. So uh, Dr. Russo um, and Heather Irwin, are one of our presenters, I think have both served in this capacity. Um, so thanks for being on and supporting the SIG today. Uh, and just want to welcome everyone and also invite you, if you're interested in CISPAP, you should look into becoming part of the SIG. There is conversations that can go on um, online throughout the year, as well as different events that occur. So um, feel free to join the SIG as part of Shape America. So um, I get to introduce Drs. Beatley and Irwin today. Um, so I'm going to start by doing that right now. Um, so first, uh, Dr. Heather Irwin is a professor and department chair at the University of Kentucky. Uh, Heather has previously taught physical education and has spent the last 20 years working with pre-service teachers, in-service teachers, and administrators to implement quality physical education and physical activity programming. Heather has authored well over 100 publications in peer-reviewed books and journals, and she is the co-author of Dynamic Physical Education for Secondary School Children, and also currently serves as the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Teaching and Physical Education. Dr. Aaron Beatley is also a professor at the University of Kentucky, where he teaches physical education, teacher education, coaching education, and youth physical activity promotion. Dr. Beatley regularly collaborates with teachers both nationally and internationally on CISPAP. He has been one of the lead advocates for CISPAP since its inception in 2006, both here in the US and across the globe. Aaron has also published well over 100 peer-reviewed publications, and he also serves as a longtime author of Dynamic Physical Education, but for sec uh, elementary school children. Uh, Dr. Beatley has um, been an essential, been essential also in working with Gopher and Bob Pengrazi to create and implement hundreds of free lessons on the Dynamic Physical Education website. So without further ado, I'm gonna let Aaron and Heather take it over. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so we're, we are glad to be here. Thank you so much for attending and we look forward to sharing um, what we know and uh, listening and learning from all of you. Um, as Dr. Shinteo suggested or it introduced us, I'm Heather and this is Erin and um, we're in the same, I guess, office space because we're married. So just to clear up any confusion um, and we're not gonna be on the same screen probably at the same time, just so it's not distracting. But I think all of you can see the PowerPoint right now and uh, we'll go from there. I'm gonna start out and then I'll pass it along to Aaron here in just a little bit. And then I think at the end there's room for questions and that type of thing. And as Audra indicated, I think you can include any questions that you may have um, during the time that we're presenting in the chat. So uh, we're happy to talk towards the end. So um, as we 
offered and volunteered to talk about CISPAP, Comprehensive School Physical Activity Programs, the gap between research and practice. So um, we are assuming that our audience doesn't know a whole lot about CISPAP. However, from a lot of the names that I see as far as participants, I know many of you are experts and possibly probably more of an expert on this than I am. So um, here we go. We will start. Let's see if I can get this to move forward. Okay, so uh, starting out, as uh, Dr. Santeo suggested, CISPAP was kind of thought, brought up, um, imagined in 2006. That wasn't the first time that this concept had been um, put into the schools, but it was the first time that a group of scholars in the United States got together and basically developed and wrote a position statement on it. And that basically stemmed from a focus on the whole child, which many of you may have heard of the whole, sc whole school, whole child, whole community model by Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So this was their model. Um, this obviously uh, stemmed around health, the health of, of children. And you can see it involves lots of different entities. Um, and we today are focusing, or I guess the, the group was focusing mostly on the physical education and physical activity part or component of the WISC model. So just an overview of this session, and, or I guess a, a brief summary of the journey to getting to this point. Uh, a, like I kind of talked about earlier, it, this is really nothing new. Again, in the United States, it kind of became a formality, if you will, in 2006, but across the globe, this concept had been, had emerged well before that. Um, we also want to acknowledge that it's not necessarily rocket science. So uh, we are here just to present on, and all the people before us, that it was, it's resource building. It's utilizing uh, different people and expertise uh, in and around schools to focus on enhancing school physical activity for, for children and youth. Um, it's a framework, it's evolving all the time, and it's multifaceted. So those are kind of, that's where we're stemming from. Uh, documents through the years, as we talked about earlier, um, the, the document on the left is the official, I think, 2006 first page of the position statement on CISPAP. Since then, there have been other documents and things like that, frameworks developed from Centers for Disease Control. You can see active schools in there. Many other, uh, I guess, programs have, have joined forces here. Um, all the way to most recently, the one on the right is, I think, the second version of the updated CISPAP position statement. So um, it's gone through many iterations. As you can see here on this next slide, it's kind of a nice visual of kind of all the different graphics that different programs or, or uh, collaboratives have used to describe CISPAP. But as you can see, there are five basic main components, which we'll go and kind of get into uh, in just a little bit. So I think the main question or background here is why do we care about physical activity or why is this such an important push in physical education or physical activity in schools, et cetera. So uh, back in 2010, um, there was a series of articles that were published by Charles Bash, I think I'm pronouncing his name correctly, and he went through a bunch of different health indicators and one that he pointed out was physical activity. And I think um, his push was that it was a leading, that physical activity wasn't one of the learning, leading learning indicators, I'm sorry, but we're gonna point out here that it is a leading health indicator. So you can see all of the positive or many positive benefits of individuals, no matter what age, being physically active, physiologically, cognitive, mental. And so in this day and age, we're really focused uh, uh, basically post-COVID on social emotional learning. So not only does the physical aspect come out, but the mental emotional piece is also really important. 
As far as back to those 2010 articles, what Bash found is that healthier students are better learners. So again, um, when we're going to principals, administrators, people who make decisions in schools, this can be a really important point to make to them. It's not just about uh, the, the, final, the final product of test scores, for instance, but it's the process almost that healthier students are better learners. Uh, he again pointed out educationally relevant health issues and you can see that there were eight different kind of points or components here. And the one that we tend to focus on, at least in our field, is the, sorry, the physical inactivity piece as being really important in students' education and, and their outcomes. So going along with that, uh, physical activity is also a leading academic indicator. So not just health, but academic. And you've probably seen a lot of these points made um, in different from different articles, the media, et cetera. But we know that physical activity can help with a lot of different aspects, starting with cognition, with blood flow to the brain, all the way up into attentiveness, concentration, memory, et cetera. So it may not lead directly to test scores or, or increasing the test scores, but it's going to facilitate, hopefully, um, improvement in that area. So, when we are referring to some of the terminology that's related to CISPAP or Comprehensive School Physical Activity, we always try to differentiate among these three terms because people in our profession and people, the general public, get these, tend to get these confused. And it is somewhat of an important difference to make among them. So physical activity, as you can see, is movement produced by contracting skeletal muscle that increases energy expenditure. It can be done at any time. It can change from moment to moment, from day to day. So one day I can be active 20 minutes. The next day I can be active for three hours. So that can go up and down. It can be spontaneous. Exercise is basically physical activity conducted with the intention of developing physical fitness. So this, when I talk to my students anyway, at our university, as I say, this is more of an adult type of term. So not very many children plan out their physical activity. For them, it's more spontaneous. And for adults, oftentimes we exercise because we actually plan it out in our day. And then the last term is fitness. And this is a set of attributes or characteristics that people have relating to their ability to actually perform the physical activity. And as I mentioned, physical activity itself can change drastically from one day to the next, but fitness is more of this trait where it doesn't change. It takes a while to change that over time. So if I wanna increase or improve my fitness levels, it takes me a lot longer than it does to increase my physical activity, for instance. Um, unfortunately, if I don't do much physical activity, then my fitness levels may decrease at a quicker rate than they might increase or improve. Uh, we also like to talk about physical activity promotion or physical activity itself as an umbrella term, and it encompasses a lot of different ideas, words, terms, things, physical education being one, um, sports being another. We can promote physical activity through recreational organizations. We can promote it in families, those types of things. Another term is physical literacy and, um, sorry, uh, physical literacy is also an umbrella term that incorporates all of these particular aspects or components. So just things to think about and how do students, do they know that they're being active and what it's doing for their body, for their mind? in the long run. This next slide encompasses or kind of uh, gives you a picture of all of the different organizations or um, collaboratives that influence a child. And it can be a child's physical activity ultimately as well. But all of these um, things, locations, they, they impact. The one that we particularly focus on out of all of these today is schools. And so why would we, comprehensive school physical activity program, why do we think that schools are the place to 
incorporate or to push physical activity for youth. So uh, we believe that schools are attended by most youth. So it makes the most sense to go to the schools as opposed to those other entities. Schools are full of trained people. We are trained to work with kids, to establish positive relationships with um, children, to care for them, to obviously to educate them. We do have resources in schools and connections and the connections can be with the community, uh, within the community, with faith-based organizations, with um, police, um, with parents, with families, with the community centers and that type of thing. And then the last, basic main reason, I guess, is that schools have a history of public health involvement with school nurses. Um, they used to be locations where children would get vaccinated. I don't know if you're old like me. I can still remember when I was younger uh, having lice checks uh, when I was in school. So, I mean, they did a lot of public health types of things in schools, and that's just a historical thing. So that's why schools make sense for reaching the most um, adolescents and children. So help wanted, uh, we need leaders for these for this CISPAP or Comprehensive School Physical Activity Programs. Doesn't mean that that person has to do everything, um, but we do need people to lead the effort and to encourage others and to provide guidance for others. So who leads these efforts? You look at the different people in schools and of, of all the qualified people, probably the most qualified person in a school would be the physical education teacher. Uh, maybe some general education teachers, as you can see, others are listed here, nurses, parents, coaches, and other stakeholders. So these are people who you might want to pull into the effort um, and into the, into the charge, but physical education teachers probably have the best background for doing this. All right, and uh, just a little bit more background, I guess. Comprehensive school physical activity programs. Again, like I mentioned earlier, it's not just a United States and a United States thing. So there are other programs uh, going on throughout the world. These are just a few of them that uh, demonstrate this is not just focused here, and that we are um, getting pushed for this all over the globe. So the next slide starts our research to practice information. And so I'm gonna do the old switcheroo with Aaron real quick, and then he's gonna share research to practice. Hello, hope we're doing well. I always wanted to slide in like Chris Collinsworth. Um, my name's Aaron Beatley, again, as I was introduced earlier. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit, if I can figure these toggles out here. Um, a little bit about how we've moved from or, or what we do with research and how it moves into practice. And just real quick today, I looked up on Google Scholar um, and in 2022 and 2023, I think there were 40 papers that had CISPAP somewhere that, that came up. So there's lots of research going on with CISPAP. What else is going on is there's research within each individual component of CISPAP. So um, I, I want that to be considered and, and just to think about that, that it's, we have this CISPAP, whether it's policy and, and several of you on here have done lots of work with this, whether it's policy or if it's what teachers think and those types of, of, of questions, as well as does recess work. And so there's, there's the research looking at CISPAP and then there's the research looking at several components and, and not necessarily tied to that. So there's lots going on with this. And um, so just wanted to share some ideas. Um, how am I moving here? Space. There we go. Um, just this book um, that was edited by uh, Russ Carson and Colin Webster um, is, is the most up-to-date, most current um, pieces, or yeah, the, the Tetris thing threw me off there. Um, looking at how we're putting research and, and it's got tons of chapters and um, really if, if you're into this and want to learn more about comprehensive school physical activity programs I would encourage you to, to dig this out if nothing else the chapters are going to be referenced by future research as well so I think this is something to look at as a as a foundation as you start to move in there's it, it, it covers I don't know how many chapters in there but it's it's um, it's a great resource if, if that's um, of interest. 
So what I want to start out with, because I'm going to frame all of the discussion on what the research says about each of these components um, within this theory here. Okay. So in 2016, Beats, and I think Tim was on this, as well as Russ Carson and several others, Michael Beats at South Carolina, kind of came up with this theory. They were in the process. Beats is, it does a lot with um, uh, after-school programs. But it's this idea of expanding with, with the offerings that we have. We can expand the offerings, we can extend the offerings, and we can enhance the offerings. So I'm going to couch um, each of the components and the research related each components into this. So expanding it is replacing low active time with more active time. So that would be like taking classroom activity that is sedentary and turning it into an activity time or take recess, which ironically is typically pretty sedentary. If you look at the research on this and, and turn it into more activity. So that's expanding the activity that's done during time that's already offered. Then we have extending the time, and that's lengthening the current time designated for physical activity. So that's giving more physical education, which most of us on here have beat that drum, or offering longer recess or more recess, um, giving making sports um, offered for for youth as well. Uh, we know that some of the most of the research suggests that the vast majority of students drop out of sports by the time they're twelve. And if you talk to those that offer sports they would say, well, there's no student, no kids that want to be involved. And if you talk to the kids, there's like, there's nowhere to play. So looking into expanding or extending those offerings. And then the last piece is enhancing. So taking what we offer and making it better. And this goes, relates to physical education, making it better. We're, whether it's increasing activity time during PE or it's uh, offering activities that they can use during uh, recess. So I'll talk a little bit about that when I get to recess. Um, there's lots of different ways. So these three areas, whether we're gonna expand it, extend it, or enhance the physical activity is based on this theory and, and the, what they call three, Kim can help me out, but the, three E's, theory of three E's and an O or something, a DEO, but it, it, it's, it's kind of catchy and it helps for us to remember. And this is how we'll, I'll, I'll frame this as we move forward. So physical education, um, this is one of the, I think, I don't, one of the diagrams of, of over the years of CISPAP, and there's been a billion of them, had a, a physical education as the star at the top. And that was one of the, in, in the a variety of groups that I've been involved with, with CISPAP over the years, one of the things we've been very insistent on is making sure that we use physical education as a foundation, especially if we're using schools. And the thinking behind that is, is if we go to a principal and say, hey, we got this CISPAP idea, we want, and I'm the PE teacher, we want more CISPAP, we want more physical activity. And the PE, and the principal comes to watch my PE class and it's terrible and the students are sitting down and it's not a very effective learning environment, they're probably not gonna wanna do more. So we want physical education to be the foundation. If you as the PE teacher have a terrible PE program and you go to your students and say, hey, come to the after school program, we're gonna have lots of fun and physical activity, they're probably not gonna buy into it if they're not buying into physical education. So we want that to be the root of, of, of the foundation of it. So with respect to the literature um, and what we can, some of this is answered and some of this, we, there's a lot to, to be done. Um, Expanding would be in, in increasing the, the activity time or decreasing sedentary time during physical education. How long do you talk as a teacher? Um, some of the work done years and years and years ago, probably before some of you were born with McKinsey uh, that found that teach, kids were active about 38% of the time. And with lots and lots and lots of intervention, they were able to get it to 50. So what that says is we talk a lot. And we're not, or we have lots of lines. And so we're not creating activities that are, that are promoting or that are fostering these activities. Um, our curricular choices, are we picking activities that are, um, that aren't particularly active? And, and again, part of this is not to get into this into the weeds too much, but how are we defining physical activity? Because we get into this a little bit with all oh, kids are just standing still and they're not moving while we're playing, doing tennis or we're doing gymnastics when, 
actually they're involved and engaged. So is physical activity the question or is it engagement? Is that what we're after it? And, and we have to kind of tease these apart in physical education, our pedagogical decisions, whether we're having lines or whether we're having students sit down, how we're getting partners. If it takes us five minutes to get kids and partners and everybody's sitting there waiting, uh, that's, that's probably part of the issue. And MVPA, I kind of talked about that, and, and we don't want 100% MVPA, and I, I'm not even sure, sure that M or V in PA, it's probably a little bit of everything, and, and we want them to be engaged. But th these are questions that, that can be answered and, and discussed um, with respect to expanding. Extending. We've, we've asked for adding physical education forever, not suggesting that we don't ask for that, but I think there's other things that we need to to be looking at is, for example, do we connect PE to outside of the gymnasium or the teaching space? Um, I was just on a doctoral com um, committee at um, KU Leuven in Belgium, and one of the things they're looking at is how we can teach things like parkour and smash ball in physical education and get students to want to do that during recess when they have the choice and or outside of school as well. So those are just some questions that can be answered and looked at. Um, add more PE lessons, obviously, uh, more time to PE or more lessons. Um, and then, and, and, you know, this is one that's a little bit out of the realm of PE, but I guess it is. It would be the PE teacher taking their planning time or working in their schedule when they have extra planning to try and get kids more active with whether it's offering awards for behavior, whatever it is, trying to get more offerings and extend those offerings of physical education. And then enhancing implement efficient lessons. Um, so you're not getting any more, you're not gonna get any more PE. This is what enhances things. So what are we gonna do during PE? Efficient lessons, work on motivation and meaningful um, experiences. Do we give kids choices? Are we worried about their perceptions of competence? Are they having a sense of individuality and some social support? Are they enjoying it? Are there, is there a connection? All those types of things that help. And we know that those are, the, are what makes physical activity matter in the lives of kids. Safe environment, obviously we want to do that. And then generate useful assessments. I have a colleague that uses the MyMove app or it created the MyMove app, but and I encourage you to check it out because it, it's assessment that it's, it's students that are, they're talking about what they like and why they like it. And it gives teachers a chance to, to have discussions with students. But those are the types of assessments that we want. We want authentic assessments in physical education to push us forward. So that's the first uh, component. And then some selfless plugs here. I encourage you to check this out. Dynamic PE ASAP. Tim and Heather's book is, has links to it as well. Or it has, uh, there's lessons on the website from their book as well as our book. The, the 20th edition came out. Again, resources for physical education. Check this out. It's free. All you have to do is give them an email address and you have access to it. If you have any questions about this, don't hesitate to email me. I'd love to talk to you about it. So during the school day, how are we going to look to expand, expand, extend, and enhance? Teach with activity for expanding in the classrooms or teaching with activity, getting students up and moving, taking students outside. These are very simple. Um, Heather had a grant several years ago and we worked in schools. And one of the things that the teachers told us is they didn't think they had time to get kids more active. And now they think they don't, they, they don't have time not to do this. They have to get these Offer them breaks from academic rigor, but introducing and teaching concepts with activity. Um, arranging the room. This is, I mean, you walk into some rooms and you, you, you've all been in schools. You walk in some classrooms and you're like, man, this is a place to be. That's quite a, you know, is, or is it desks in a row? And you're like, wow, this is not the place to be. Set those desks on the outside. Leave space in the middle. Have a rug in the middle. Allowing students to do yoga and Pilates and other things. Um, Active hallways or an active, uh, extra active classrooms are, are another relatively new. Um, we did a, a study with middle school, I'm looking at Heather, how long ago was it? About six years ago, and you were standing desks, and we didn't have, not everybody had a standing desk. Some kids got the standing desks and some kids didn't. And we asked, you know, we got feedback from the classroom teacher or from the, the teacher as well as the students. And they loved it. I mean, students, they had the flexibility. They could stand or they could sit so they could have less sedentary time. The only thing the students didn't like is the, the desks were really, really dull. 
they were gray and they didn't like that. They wanted them to be colorful. So that was the only negative thing that we heard with that. So those are some ways to expand it and extending it. Take the long way when you walk in the hallways. I know some of you before here, before this had questions about high school. And one of the things that high schools are doing is saying, oh yeah, we're getting active. We get them active for five minutes every hour. Well, if they have to walk during those five minutes, then yeah, you're making them walk five minutes. But do we have students take the long way? Do we, instead of coming in from recess right by our door, do we walk all the way around the school for elementary age? So active hallways is another way we can extend it. I think there's lots of ideas and things going around now with the classroom. When I first started this in, in gosh, 2004 or so, um, I started doing some work with classroom teachers and there were lots and lots of people in the physical education world that liked to chew me out because they thought that this was going to get rid of physical education. And we have come a long way. And this is one area that I think we've done a lot with. We're using technology to enhance it. We're providing more choices for students. Um, another thing you can do, idea, I don't know if there's any research on this, but allowing students to create the videos. It's, it's just a great way to integrate technology. Students are so much better at it now that you can have phones and all kinds of iPads, tablets to take, pick, take videos and they can edit it, put their sound on it and create their own. You have a group of seventh graders that are creating it for a school, for a group of second graders. There's that second graders look up to seventh graders. It's about that generation difference. And there's that tie-in of, wow, that, that, that's my brother. That, and th there's just so much that goes on when you create that environment. Recess. This is one of my favorites. In, a, in a, a former life, I did some research with this, and 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 this is one that I think is has so much potential. Um, so, how are we going to expand providing equipment? I know this sounds really silly, but if you were to walk into a, a gym where you work out, or a rec center where you work out, and it was empty, you wouldn't go back. Yet we'll tell kids just go out and play. Well or we'll give them monkey bars or whatever they call them slides. And, and we know that, you know, some students like that, but not a lot do. So we need to make the space more attractive with equipment, have active supervision. We've done some research on this. And if you can get the supervisors just to get up, it's so much better. The kids, it, it, there's so much more engagement and the students will be more active just by having the supervisor up. And again, the little things that we can do, like what I said earlier, making, um, I know some colleagues at uh, Northern Colorado have done work in the past with recess activity of the week, where you just add new activities to PE. You take the beginning of your re of PE and, and of the year and teach recess activities. There's research that this works. This is what gets kids more active, having new activities, having activity zones that I'll talk about in a second. Another thing that, that it, it, with respect to extending is Instead of having, and I don't know this is technically extending, but instead of having a half hour recess at lunchtime where the kids have to scarf their meal and get out is give them 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes in the evening or in the afternoon. We've had some schools here and, and actually right in the town where Heather and I live that have done this and have had great success with it. And, and it's the same amount of time and their scheduling and those types of things. It doesn't, add, but, but having that extra recess. It's not even really extra time to be active, but we know the longer students are out at recess, the less active they are and the diminishing returns, et cetera. Um, the, 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 the recess activity of the week. I'm going to talk about um, walk-ins for high school. So this is one that uh, there's not much research on it. I'm just going to lay that out there. If you know some research, please put it in the chat and let us know. Not much research on high schools, but I will say that I was at a school in Hong Kong, gosh, this is pre-COVID, so probably 2017, something like that, 18. And I'm standing in the gym and it's empty. And so I'm standing there trying to do some texting and stuff. And all of a sudden, kids start coming in. And I mean, some of them are over playing badminton. Some of them are doing hacky sack. Some are walking. Some are playing basketball. They're just, all, they're doing Tai Chi, all kinds of stuff going on. And, and there's, a, there's a teacher sitting over in the corner and it's like, well, at least they're active, but this isn't what I would consider educating physical edu in physical education. This is, you know, the old reading the newspaper. So I went down, I, I, I kind of got fired up. So I went down and I asked the guy, I said, so what is this? He said, oh, this is the drop-in lunch for him. 
And then I tried to change my attitude. Obviously, I, I found out what I needed to find out. It was, it was unbelievable. This is what can happen in high schools that they, they were running themselves. Kids were active. It was it was incredible. And, and these are the things that can happen. The last thing I'll touch on, on this is we've done um, research on this in, in Nebraska and Iowa. And we've done some stuff out in Arizona as well where you have activity zones. And just real quick, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I'm getting from my own time. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. But so basically you set up zones. And one of the zones can be the dance, the dance room or a dance zone. One can be a soccer zone. One can be basketball zone. One can be the, as I said earlier, the recess activity of the week, the raw. That can be a, 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 a zone as well. So there's lots of, of ways that we can um, – have to uh, divide these up, but we found that kids will be more active. We did ones and it, it, it didn't really know this was going to be an outcome and it really wasn't an outcome of a study per se, but one of the principals at the schools came up and said, you know what, since we've been doing this zone, we have far fewer arguments and, and, and fights at recess. And this was, he was a K-6 school. And he said, our fifth and sixth graders really get territorial and some kids would walk across and all kinds. And he said, we've basically eliminated them just with this. Now, I don't know what the reasoning was for that, but it's interesting when you get into the research world and you, you think, oh, I'm worried about the physical activity level. And there's some other outcome that becomes as equally as useful. So beyond the school day, this is one before and after school physical activity. The... Um, if we can, looking to expand and foster active transport, especially middle school and high school, to get kids to walking to school if we can. Um, we know there was a study done years ago, and I should have, I don't know exactly where it was. It was in England, and they found that kids that actively commuted to school, when they got to school, it was a middle school, when they got to school, they put them in a holding, not it wasn't a tank, but a holding tank. You know, most schools have that, like the gym or whatever. The kids that, that actively transport, transported to school were more active once they got to school as well. So these are ways that we can teach and, and teaching activities are um, Heather's two girls went to school here in Georgetown and they had a physical education teacher that was tremendous about making his lessons go along with things that were going on in the school. So if there was a tennis clinic coming up, he had tennis as, as one of his units. If there was a, a walk, a charity walk or a, a, a coming up, he had walk jog as part of his coming, as coming up and, and really sold that to them. And, and let them see that there's other ways of being active. Um, organized physical, neighborhood physical activity, collaborating with scouts, any kind of organization that was gonna be involved with that can be involved with um, promoting physical activity. As Heather said earlier, physical literacy, we are not physical literacy as physical educators. We're part of it, but there's a lot more people involved in scouts, clubs, YMCAs, Parks and Rec, all of those are involved in physical literacy as well. We have a great chance to lead it, but I think it's important to understand there are other um, entities. I'm getting a little short here on time, but um, staff involvement, the one I wanna focus on here is Enhance over on the, uh, the Golden Sneakers and the, um, the Golden Goose Award. So I worked with schools in Fort Worth um, Texas, and they had, a, they had a goose get out of school early award. And the principals would give, let teachers have a half hour out early. If, I don't know if they still do it or not. The teacher that did the most physical activity engagement staff with, with, the, with their students and, and promoted physical activity the most got to get out of school early. And you wouldn't believe what teachers will do for an extra half hour on Friday afternoon. And these are the types of things that we can acknowledge and, and let staff know, hey, we appreciate what you're doing. Even if it's a PE teacher that maybe has their, you know what, they have, they have their planning period at the end of every, every Friday, they have planning period the last hour. Maybe give up that half hour to get some teachers to, to try and do some work just to get it kickstarted. Again, these are just ideas of things that are out there. And then family. Obviously, this is one that we know that family involvement is tremendously important and has to be something that we uh, foster and and. If, if we want physical activity to matter, it's going to have to matter. For, for a lot of students, it's going to have to matter outside of, of physical education. So physical activity calendars, Heather and I teach an activity or a physical activity in the classroom class. And we make our students or we, one of the assignments is they create a physical activity calendar and give students things that they can do when they're out of school, 
And when they're um, snow days or cold days like we have today, um, or during holidays, that kind of thing. Um, extending it, offering physical activity nights. Uh, these are, again, these are just ideas that have spawned. Some of them have been researched. Some of them haven't been researched. Um, open the playgrounds. I, I know this one, I've I presented this lots all over the country. And this one, people are like, what do you mean? Open the playgrounds to after school or evening parent active social. Some playgrounds are closed at four o'clock. No one's allowed on them. So if you can, one of my daughter's um, school, her last year there, they had parent socials and the kids played on the playground and the parents were just hung out. Some of the parents played even better. So anything we can do to foster and, and there's, there's some research on this, but I think this is something that we could probably do more of. And then just as a wrap up again, going back to that enhance, expand, extend, my intent here was not to obviously present all the research and what's out there. It was to show you kind of some ideas. What are these areas with physical education or staff involvement? What's been done? What needs to be done? And, and again, I hope we, we've, we shared some ideas and gave you a little bit of found foundation of where, what the research has shown, what it can show us. We haven't even scraped the surface of this. I mean, it's been going on. The, the field has been, 2006, I think, is when CISPAP, the first statement, again, it's been around forever before that. It just kind of organized it and gave it a framework. Um, and it's still around. And I think there's lots more that needs to be done to really enhance what we're offering and to make it more um, streamlined. If you have questions, I'm sure there'll be questions, but if you have questions for us after you don't get a chance, or if you're watching this on recording, um, if you have positive things to say, the one on the left is perfect. If you have complaints, <laughs> the one on the right is perfect. And you can let her know. Um, I never noticed what's what? Oh, you're, you're, okay. TikTok, Twitter is, is different. I, 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 that's not her name, but anyway, um, sorry, I got distracted. So anyway, if you have questions, please let us know. We'd be more than happy to um, answer your questions. And if you have any questions now or have some comments and you want to share, we're by no means do we know all of this. We're just willing to share and listen as well. So thank you. And now I stop sharing. Thanks, Aaron and Heather. We really appreciate your time. So there were a couple of questions that came in before um, this recording. So we're going to start there. And then um, if you have questions, feel free for those of you that are alive to raise your hand and I'll call on you um, in order. So the first question that um, came in was how, how do we uh, make the link between PE and our healthy life? And so thinking about CISPAP and physical education and kind of linking all of that back to healthy life, how do we, how do we do that? Well, we said we weren't going to do this because we get flashbacks of talking to your old aunt and uncle during COVID, but um we won't talk, go in too loud and talk too loud. I think the, I think how we, to connect, to connect, I'll just be direct, to connect it, we're physical activity, that's physical education. I think there's some health concepts we can discuss, but I think we have to just focus that, yeah, what we're trying to do now, this is kind of, we're getting better at this, but we don't have a lot of evidence that what we do matters long-term. So, does what we do in second grade or what we do in ninth grade, does that impact adults? We can impact ninth graders. We, we've got evidence on that, but do we have an impact long-term? And I mean, I think we have a little bit of um, some of the old school physical activity research and things, but we don't have a ton that we impact adults. Now, I think there are bits and pieces. You can argue that if you have physical education, maybe you're more skilled and more skilled or more active. Or you could argue that you have a more positive attitude and maybe more positive attitude. But I don't think we've done much to connect what we do in the third grade. Does that impact that same person when they're 25 years old or 30 years old or 80 years old? Heather, anything to add to that? And I guess I would just say there's, yeah, kind of uh, not strong, somewhat weak evidence showing that physical activity does track. So yeah. hopefully if we get them active as younger children, they'll be active, you know, in, in their adolescent years and then on into their adult lives. If anybody has studies and things, I saw, I don't know if it was a comment or not, but I'd be more than happy to, I just haven't seen any that 
but yeah, we do have the physical activity tracks. Thank you. I don't see any live questions yet, so I'll move on to another question that was submitted. Um, do you feel like strategies for translating research to practice are the same for CISPAP as they are at, uh, for other focuses within our field? So we kind of talked about this a little bit because we did have some questions that were sent ahead of time. I mean, I think this is similar to uh, CISPAP, but other instances as well that, yes, you can try to apply them in the same way. Um, I was trying to think of, trying to dissect kind of what this question meant. So I wasn't exactly sure um, the person who asked it, what exactly they were asking. Like, were they talking about maybe social emotional types of components or learning? I'm not exactly sure, but I do think that what we could, what you can try to do is a, get teacher buy-in, B, um, notify them if they don't already know of what all of the positive benefits are or can be, and then try to give them, I guess what we've learned over time is to try to give teachers, administrators, parents, families, community, um, the easiest, I guess the easiest, least obstructive way of doing something so that it doesn't seem like it's another thing that they have to do or add to their plate. I don't know if that answered. Yeah, I think the, yeah, I don't know if this was asked like a programmatic thing or, but I think a lot of times, I know there's several researchers and things on here that we get so wrapped up in our power analysis and all this kind of stuff that we worry way too much about that instead of getting pictures, stories, and numbers. And numbers can be, you know what, we tried a, a, a parent activity night and we got zero. Then we tried a parent activity night and we tried this way and we got 15. That's huge. And, and take pictures. I know this sounds simple, but these are the kinds of things that when we do these early on and we start, regardless of the program, if you're doing a reading program or if you're wanting to do a yoga program or if you're wanting to do a CISPAP, that if we can, picture stories and numbers are tremendously important and starting small. Because we go in, and this is one of the big debates we had early on with, with CISPAP is, well, what is a CISPAP? If they only do one thing, is that a CISPAP? And we tried, we, we kind of got snarky about it. And then after the end, it was like, well, that's dumb. Well, if they do one thing, great. Why are we worried about whether you want to label it a CISPAP or not label it a CISPAP? And do you have to have two? Do you have to have three? Just trying to do something to improve the lives of kids, I think, is is important. Yeah, thanks for that. And I think from like a research standpoint, it is, as you're saying, it's hard to to share those stories of those changes that you might see based on implementation or things that you tried, right? right. And so for those of you that might pair with researchers or work with people at a university setting and want to publish successes, I think there's places where you can do that, whether it's a blog um, or through strategies or um, JOPERD or things like that, where there might be uh, places to kind of share those successes because those are really important in helping people translate some of you know, the research behind and how we implement things and then what that actually looks like in the setting. The last question that was submitted, you really kind of talked about in your presentation, just strategies and resources. Um, at the high school setting. I don't know if you wanted to add to that or if anybody else had questions, um, we can kind of open it up or even if you have comments to add on to things that Aaron and Heather have been talking about. I mean, as I'll just go, just uh, as Aaron kind of gave some examples, but also in, I know there are examples in the comprehensive or the CISPAP uh, position statement, especially the most recent one of, they have tables in there about ideas at the elementary level and the secondary level. So, I mean, that might be a place to start, but I think drop-ins at lunchtime, I mean, it's gonna be so school specific um, and dependent upon your schedule and what classes you have and how many teachers and resources, et cetera. But, um, it seems like maybe lunchtime or, or just drop-ins during specific times of the day might be a neat idea. 
um, clubs, if they have club times that they offer during school, maybe physical activity clubs could be one of those. I can still remember way back to my middle school days when um, it would be like end of the quarter time and you, you get to choose three different activities that you wanted to participate in and you were guaranteed supposedly one of those activities. And some teachers chose to do um, more of a inside cooking type of class and others were outside doing different types of physical activities. So, I mean, maybe it's just something like that at the end of every quarter. It's a half a day of a fun day where you get to opt in to different activities. So she didn't finish that story. She's still sour about it I'm because very upset. she had to learn how to sew a button and everybody else got to be outside. So this is I did not get one of my top three choices and I was inside sewing buttons while other people were outside on the track running and doing fun things. But regardless, there were options for physical activity. So um, that that's just something that comes to mind. Um, but student led things at the secondary level is going to be huge. Anytime you can get because uh, we're not cool anymore, of course, for those of you who have kids and work with those of you who work with adolescents. So if, they, if you can find someone that's, that's neat, cool um, in their eyes, that's doing something physically active, then that's a way, I think, to attract more engagement. And this might be a, a research topic for someone, but when I was doing recess work a long time ago, I tried, I can't find any reason why middle school and high school get rid of recess. There's nothing, no, it's just, it just disappears. And I, I don't understand that. So, if, I mean, that could be a bring it back. I mean, I know there are places that have brought it back and had great success with it. Um, so, again, not not as much the research stuff, but it would be nice if that stuff was shared via blogs or whatever that, you know, so it doesn't have to say all the research says. Well, the research doesn't say, but it does make a lot of sense that if you have recess in middle school, the kids will be more active. Makes sense. I was just going to say, Aaron, and you hit on this a little bit, but in my experience trying to implement or working with schools to implement CSPAB, uh, one of the most important types of data to collect is the data that isn't all that important to you and me oftentimes. Like, I'm interested, did they get more active? Did they develop more motor skills? Can they throw a ball better? Uh, but often building supervisors, school boards, they want to know, did bullying go down at recess? Did... Um, did kids show up to school on time? You know, was there, was there less absenteeism? So when, anytime you're implementing any of these things, if you can collect or write down or record those types of data, that's so much more meaningful when you present these things to um, the community or the school board or the principals to try to get investment or support moving forward. They don't care oftentimes about some of the stuff I care about. Right. Great point, Tim. Any other questions or comments before we close up? All right, so just a couple of announcements, I guess. Um, there are some deadlines coming up in relation to the CISPAP SIG. Uh, so if you're unfamiliar, every year we look for a new um, chair elect for the CISPAP Research SIG. Uh, and that nomination, you can self-nominate or somebody else can nominate you, uh, is due on February 2nd. And I'm going to drop the link in here. And this link is actually going to be um, good for both things that I'm talking about. So if you're interested in becoming more involved in the CISPAP SIG and want to run for chair elect, please um, fill out the application. We would love to have uh, your name in the hat. And then the other thing is the Innovative Paper Award. So if you're someone on here that publishes papers and you published a paper last year in relation to CISPAP. Um, it had to have been in print in the 2023 uh, calendar year. Uh, that is also due on February 2nd. It's called the Innovative Paper Award, the CISPAP Innovative Paper Award. So just those um, two announcements. And I think that that's it. Audra, did you have anything else um, before we ended today? No, I just I put in the chat that the recording and the link shared will be available on the, the web page. So um, stay tuned. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming today. And thanks, Aaron and Heather, for being our presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone.
Bye, everyone.